It happens to all of us. Despite our best intentions, we make poor decisions and then have to live with the consequences. Part of running life's race is dealing with those bad decisions. Are you stuck with the after effects of a bad move you've made? Joshua made a poor call during his conquest of Canaan, and how he dealt with it can help us deal with our bad choices. Want to know more? Stay with us. From Chicago's Moody Church, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. We're in a series on getting started right, lessons from the life of Joshua. Join us in Joshua chapter 9 as Dr. Lutzer speaks on, Let's Make the Best of a Bad Decision. Making the Best of a Bad Decision. One day, I bought a sports coat. Because I'm a last born, I find it difficult to make decisions like that. Didn't know if I liked it, took it home, and was sure I didn't. I don't think I wore it anywhere. In fact, a couple of months later, when we boxed up some clothes to give them to charity, I just put it in and thought, good riddance. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could uh, do that way with all of our bad decisions? We'll simply take care of them and say, good riddance, let's move on. Now, if you buy a house, and that's a bad decision, if you don't have enough money to pay for it, or if it was overpriced or whatever, now we begin to talk about decisions that are a little bit more serious. And if you begin to talk about something like marriage, which represents an oath before God, now we're talking really serious. Mary Welchel received this letter from a listener just a couple of weeks ago. I'd like to thank you for reading this letter and answering my question from a biblical standpoint. I was separated from my husband for seven years, and then he filed for a divorce. During those seven years, we had tried marriage counseling, and when we were close to having a major break go our way, my husband stopped coming and said that if I really loved him, we didn't need counseling. Well, our divorce is final, and she gives the date, and she says he has remarried and now realizes that was a mistake, so he has started calling me asking if he divorced his new wife, would I take him back? Hmm. Before he was married, I told him that I would take him back because I wanted our family to be together and to leave a godly legacy for our children. So my question is, do I tell him yes or no? I want to do the biblical thing. I don't know what to tell him. Well, by the time this message is over, we'll have some knowledge as to what to tell him. But for now, we just leave it and say, now that's serious. Joshua, of all things, made a bad decision. Now, sometimes we make bad decisions because we're pressured into them. I think, for example, of young women who have gotten abortions because the boyfriend wanted it or the parents wanted it. And, and so, you see, it's possible to be pressured into a bad decision. Sometimes also bad decisions are made because of rebellion. We know that it's wrong, but we want to do it anyway. The other possibility is that we are, uh, what shall I say, impulsive. We make decisions too quickly. We don't submit them to God and say, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Take your Bibles and turn to that bad decision that Joshua made. It's found in the ninth chapter of the book of Joshua. And uh, the background is this. God had told the Israelites, do not make a treaty with any people in the land. That's back in the book of Exodus, chapter 23. God said, don't make a treaty with anyone in the land. Well, wouldn't you know it? the Gibeonites who were in the land, they played a trick on Joshua and pretended that they were not in the land, from the land, and so he made a treaty with him. They made a treaty with him, yes. Now, chapter 9 opens when all the kings of the west of the Jordan heard about these things. That is, the defeat of Jericho and the defeat of Ai. You can imagine how word spread and the other kings, they were absolutely terrified. They came together to make war against Joshua and Israel. Verse 3, however, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. 
They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. The men put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes, and all the bread of their food was moldy and dry. And then they went up to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. Well, they asked questions and so forth. And then the men said, that is the Gibeonites, verse 9, Your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. We have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites. And so it goes on in verse 11, We are your servants. Make a treaty with us. Well, that's the way the trap was laid. First of all, they lied about their origin. They said that we are from a far country, and they weren't. I've been to Gibeon in Israel many years ago, and uh, Gibeon is actually just seven or eight miles north of Jerusalem. I mean, they're right, right there in the middle of the land. So they lied about their origin. They also lied about their intentions. They said, we want to worship uh, the same God that you do, and we've heard of the fame of the Lord. And so what we'd like to do is to get in on that blessing, and uh, we'll be your servants. I don't want to push the analogy too far, but isn't that a little bit like the devil? The devil says to us, uh, he lies about his origin. He doesn't tell us where these ideas that are in our minds are coming from, because he does not want us to fear him. One day, Ananias and Sapphira were having a little discussion over a couple of bagels, and uh, they said, let's lie about the amount that we sold this land for, and let's pretend that we gave it all to the church so that we look better. Now, if somebody would have said, well, when you were at your breakfast enjoying that bagel, Satan actually came and put that idea in your mind, they'd have been terrified. Could you imagine Satan revealing who he really was, showing up in the kitchen and saying, I am the devil and I have a proposal for you. <laughs> the devil never does that. He remains hidden and gives us the impression that uh, the ideas that he put in our minds are actually ours. The origin is always to be hidden. And then, of course, he lies about his intentions. <laughs> 